Good morning, everyone. Welcome and uh, welcome to everyone watching on the Cybercast. And thank you, Wayne and Joanne. That was that's a really, really good song that Wayne wrote, and they sing it really well. I've I've got a, I've got some props here. I'll, I'll bring them out later, and and we'll have some pictures later too. So you can you can just wonder what's in this box. It's uh, my wife is is addicted to ordering things on Amazon, so we get deliveries daily. We have all kinds of boxes if anybody would like some. The message today is going to be kind of like a road map to get from here to there. And uh, you know where you are, and then you can figure out maybe during the message uh, where we're going or where we're headed. <clears throat> the title of the message today is The Vine Dresser and the Vineyard. <clears throat> Vineyards and planting and, and gardens have been on my mind a lot the last couple months. With <clears throat> My wife and I kept the land Sabbath two years ago, summer before last. And uh, because I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by that, I can't, I can't prove it one way or the other, but at least I'm intrigued by it. Uh, it seemed like God thought it was a good idea. And uh, so <clears throat> I thought at the bare minimum it would be a good learning experience. And then I was really looking forward to having a garden this past summer. And on the land Sabbath went from atonement to atonement. And then I discovered after atonement last year, or year before last, that Best I could tell, and I can't prove this at all, uh, maybe some of you can disprove it, that last year would have been the uh, year of Jubilee, so we kept the land Sabbath two years in a row. So I've been excited about putting out a garden this year. <clears throat> and uh, and, and uh, I find it very interesting, this is just an aside, that like God promised in the Bible three years ago, every time Linda and I, every day when we went out to pick produce out of the garden, we wrote down everything on the calendar that we picked. How many tomatoes, how many, how many jalapenos, everything we picked. And I've, I've still got the calendar and the list. And uh, we got a lot of produce. And we're still, just like God promised in the Bible, we're still eating the produce from three years ago. We've still got hot sauce Linda made, uh, canned tomatoes, jalapenos. I don't know, we may have some more things, I don't know. But I find that fascinating. But that's just an aside. But I have been thinking a lot about gardens, and I know some of you, uh, I see Bill back there, uh, he sounds like he's a pretty good gardener, and also Ronnie, I, I love to plant tomato plants. And I always put out 36 tomato plants, and I think Ronnie puts in 72. Is that right? 76. <laughs> he, he must, Ronnie must have bought half a six pack then. <laughs> A six pack of tomatoes. <laughs> he, he may have bought another six pack too, I don't know. Let's turn to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. And the heading in my, in my Bible here at the top of uh, chapter 15 is true vine and and uh which I always think of when when I when I see that I always think of there's a couple here that their son-in-law and his business partners have a brewery named the true vine I'm not going to mention any names because the wife doesn't like me to mention names <laughs> but 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 their brewery is based on Christian principles and I think that's pretty neat that they named it true 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 vine brewery Okay, John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Christ says, I am the true vine, and my Father the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may, be, that it may bear more fruit. So we're, we're, that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. Actually, that's two of the things we're going to be talking about. So what are some of the things that are required to bear fruit? 
This is not an exhaustive list of everything, but it's some of the really important things. <clears throat> Number one, it needs a good caregiver or vine dresser. Number two, it needs a good root system. Number three, it needs to be attached to the vine. If, it, if it's a vineyard, it's, if it's not attached to the vine, it, it's not going to do anything good. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later, an example of it. Number four, it needs proper pruning. <clears throat> and that's very important as most of you probably know, you know, it's kind of painful sometimes to go out and, and uh, cut your, your bushes down around your house or different things because it looks kind of butchered for a while. But if you don't do that, it's not going to look very good. It's going to, we, we did some major pruning around our house back during the winter, I think, the early winter, because so many things had gotten so overgrown. So I got a chainsaw and cut some of it back. It looked bad to, to begin with, but now it's starting to grow up and, and looks good. So the first point I wanted, want to discuss is the attributes of the vine dresser. You know, since our loving Heavenly Father is a vine dresser and we're supposed to come like him, become like Him and be born into His family, we need to learn a little bit about what He's like. And uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24, <clears throat> and read the story about the uh, prodigal's, prodigal son. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's really interesting how the father, when the prodigal son comes home, how the father sees him coming at a distance and runs to him. When the, the, the son is just feeling so beaten up and, and remorseful. <clears throat> and, and it reminds me of <clears throat> our grandson, our eight-year-old grandson, redheaded. Uh, whenever they come to visit, uh, they always rent a truck at the airport instead of a car and, and drive from Dallas in, in a truck, a double cab truck. <clears throat> as soon as they get there, Ben always, our little grandson, Ben always jumps out of the truck and comes running up the sidewalk and jumps into my arms. I mean, he literally jumps up into my arms, and I love that. He does the same thing when we go out to see them. Uh, and Ben hasn't done anything wrong at that point, but... You know, the prodigal son, God's never done anything wrong. The prodigal son did a lot wrong, but God himself ran toward him. Okay, Luke chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 11 through 24. The parable of the lost son. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them, so he, so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And, you know, I'm sure the father had worked really hard for that. You know, probably worked his whole life for that. And so that's, uh, that's not a minor issue. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be, be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the, his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that, that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. I'm reading out of the, most, mostly, I think maybe totally out of the New King James. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he had really developed a, a repentant attitude. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. <clears throat> That's a, a beautiful mental picture. You know, most of us with our human nature, when somebody has done something wrong and especially wronged us, we want to make sure they learn the point. You know, we, want to, we tend to want to rehash it. Now, okay, what was it you did wrong and what's the lesson you learned and... 
father didn't do that. He saw that the son was remorseful and repentant. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. That's our dad. The father is our dad. <clears throat> more and more I come to realize just what a loving father that, that we have. In, in, you know, in some cases... In years past, I, I tended to kind of look at God as sometimes as kind of a mean ogre, but he's not. <clears throat> we tend to, uh, a different thought, we basically tend to think of God as being the same as our physical father, whether, whether that was a good example or a bad example. And <clears throat> not everyone had a good example in, in a physical father, and so therefore it's hard to make a connection with how loving God is. So if you didn't have a good good relationship with your father and a, a loving relationship, it would probably be good to pick out a man that that is honorable and, and loving and study people like that and to help connect with and to realize that that's how our father is. He's, he's not waiting for us to mess up and say, I knew it, I knew he was gonna mess up. He's God's pulling for us. His, his very essence is love. Everything that he does is motivated from love. <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes maybe we think we've messed up too many times and, and God's just done with this. He's like, nah, it's, it's been too many times. Maybe we think we just blew it one time too many and there's no way that God's going to, going to help us out of our mess. We'll join the club because we've all blown it plenty of times. Just as King David, we may have to suffer the consequences of our actions, but as long as we repent and turn our face to God, God will still forgive us, and he'll, he'll turn his face to us. And, of course, he loved us so much that he gave his very son for us. But he promised as long as we continue to seek him that he will draw near to us, and God cannot lie. We can take God's words, God's promises to the bank. <clears throat> I'll refer to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. I love, God says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. So that's, that's one of the keys. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. This is a beautiful passage. This is, a, this is the message God sent, to Jer sent by Jeremiah to Israel during their 70 years of captivity. And this, this is God's, is, was and is God's wish for Israel. Jeremiah 29, starting verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart <clears throat> And let's turn now to Isaiah chapter 54. It's Isaiah chapter 54, and we'll start in verse 7. Isaiah 54, 7. God says, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. So they were getting a spanking there then, basically. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. 
for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. Says the Lord, who has mercy on you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is a heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. But back to what I mentioned a while ago, maybe we think, you know, know, sometimes we might think, well, you know, I've, I've just messed up too many times. You know, you just don't really understand how bad I blew it. Maybe God's not interested in helping us anymore. Let's consider the story of Rahab, the harlot, in Joshua chapter 2. If you'll turn there. This is, this is, I find it pretty amazing. I forgot to write down the verses in Joshua chapter 2. I may just paraphrase, paraphrase this, but the fear of God, the true God, came upon the people in Jericho uh, because they had heard how God delivered them miraculously through the Red Sea and how he had helped them to conquer other enemies. And so when, when two spies were sent from Israel into into Jericho, and I'm sure most all of you know the story, Rahab the the harlot took them into her house and allowed them to hide in there when the others from the city were looking for them to to kill them or, you know, imprison them. And due to that, and due to the fact that she came to trust in God, her life was spared, and not just her life, but the life of her family and anybody that they had uh, that she had come into her house was spared. Everybody else was uh, eliminated. And in spite of the fact that she was a harlot, let's turn to chapter Matthew, chapter one, verse one, and read about her life after that, or, or a little bit about her history after that. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew 1, 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, the harlot. After that, after she was a harlot. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Continuing on down in verse 16, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born born Jesus, who is called Christ. So that's a pretty good illustration of how merciful and forgiving our Father is. When we seek Him and walk toward Him, He not only turns and looks at us or just walks toward us, He runs toward us. So since the days of unleavened bread, which puts out uh, picturing, which pictures putting sin out of our lives and keeping sin out of our lives, and since tomorrow is the day of Pentecost, which pictures the Holy Spirit, With the help of God's Holy Spirit, we are to produce fruit. So let's examine that process. And I've come to learn that if we're struggling with with a weakness, we should pray ahead of time for help from God's Holy Spirit. Like when we first wake up, if we know we have a weakness, weakness we're struggling with, we should address that first thing when we wake up because we know we're going to be tempted by it. For example... Don't wait until you see the chocolate cake and your mouth starts watering. uh, Because by then, if you try to resist it, you've probably already lost the battle. 
We need to look ahead. In James, uh, in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts, drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So let's pray ahead of time and, and ask for God's Holy Spirit, which God promised He would give to us if we turn our face to Him and seek Him. And then we don't have to keep begging Him several times every day, please help, you know, please help me with this, please help me with this, because He already promised it, that He, that he would. But rather than begging, I found it to be more effective to show gratitude and thank God for the fact that He has given me the power. It's just with the Holy Spirit, it's just a matter of accepting that power. Because when the temptation comes, we have to make the decision, well, are we going to cave into it? Or we've got the power right here, we could, we could accept the power and then accept the power. It's kind of like, it reminds me of an, an analogy. It could be if a father uh, promised his son or daughter that if you make straight A's this six weeks, I'll buy you a new bicycle. And so, you know, a few weeks go by, two or three weeks, and the father's already promised it, and he's trustworthy. Uh, but what if the kids kept, kept coming to him during that six-week period? Daddy, will you please buy me a new bicycle if I make straight A's? Will you please buy me a new bicycle? Probably after about the fifth time, the dad may be inclined to say, stop begging me. I already told you I would buy it for you. If you ask me one more time, you're not going to get it. So, you know, we don't need to, we need to pray, and we, but I think a lot of times we need to show a lot more gratitude to God and praise to God and, and less begging. The, the second uh, area I want to discuss is the importance of the root system. Let's turn to Mark verses four, I mean Mark chapter four, verses five and six. Mark chapter four, verse five and six. Re regarding the sowing of the seeds, some fell on stony ground, and where it did not have much earth, and it, earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered. It withered away. You know, a root system is really important. And when I when I plant my uh, tomatoes. Uh, I'll try to pick up, pick off a number of the branches toward the bottom so I can plant it as deep as I can so that will grow more roots. And I watched a video on YouTube here a couple of weeks ago that showed, showed the root system. Here's the regular root system and if, if you pick off the, the lower branches, here's another root system it develops. And that's where the strength comes from is from the root system. So you know, the, the better root system we have, the better fruit we can produce. And uh, I've mentioned before that I get, I get information, uh, mostly emails from various organizations, or, uh, and, I, and I find a lot of them very helpful. But I got this uh, from the Berean, and I'll just read what, what they had in this one section. <clears throat> it says, fruit is not produced all at once. That's a good point. You know, I don't, I don't stick my tomatoes in the ground and bam, I've got a tomato ready to pick. I had to wait so long. They said in the little six-pack containers for between three and four weeks after I bought them because all the stuff going in, on in our lives the last six weeks, one of them did have a little bitty tomato on it, but still not big. And I mean, for a fried green tomato, it's about that big, so <laughs> that's not going to do any good. Uh, continuing here, fruit is not produced all at once. Fruit is produced only when a tree or plant is mature and stable enough. That mere survival is no longer its top priority. That's my first wish for, for our garden plants when I put them in is, are they going to live? You know, how are they doing? You know, are they starting to wilt? And I go out there and I look at them, you know, at least every day, if not more often. <clears throat> Much of that depends on and starts with the tree or, or the plant's roots. The roots are a chief factor in the overall health of the tree. 
as well as in the quality and quantity of the fruit that is produced. The same is true of a Christian. The fruit he or she produces depends on spiritual roots. So we must be deeply rooted in God's Word and the application of His Word in our lives before we're scorched and before the storm comes. The next uh, section is item three, we must stay attached to the vine. Let's turn to John chapter 15 again. John chapter 15. We've read part of this already. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Wes, if you'd like to go ahead and put up the, the pictures. I was uh, trimming our vineyard uh, early March. First time I'd trimmed it in three years, and actually first time I'd trimmed, pruned it, the bulk of it in four or five years probably because I get so busy it's basically neglected. But I'm hoping to do better this year. Okay, that's, uh, I didn't think to take these pictures until I had already trimmed, pruned the worst vines. But you can see how that was just kind of going all over the place. There, there's different, on a vineyard, and I, when I say vineyard, we just got a little, a little play vineyard. It's not a real serious one. And it's mostly neglected, so if you're planning on putting in a vineyard, uh, you might want to check out what I'm saying. But I've, we, we, I've been doing this, and Wayne's the one that got me into it back, I don't know, eight or ten years ago. But uh, he bought me a book, and, I, and I've read most of it <laughs> and applied some of it. But it, the, the, the system that we've got a lower wire here and then an upper wire horizontally up there, and you can see the trunk going up. And so the objective is to pick off the two, pick the two best branches attach them to the lower wire, let the trunk grow on up, and then pick the, the two best branches at the top and let them grow along the top wire. But that one's, that one's a mess, not, not near as much of a mess as, as most of them were. But uh, in the process of pruning, this is not my briefcase either. If it was, I'd put duct tape on it. I'll just leave that there for now. Our, our daughter and son-in-law came, and their family came uh, about the time I was pruning the vineyard to visit, and they bought me this new pruner set, and, and this is really handy, a, a pocket to put it on on my belt so you don't have to hold it or stick it in your pocket. But I, w I was pruning the vineyard, and when it's such a mess, it's, I think some of those, it would take me like 45 minutes uh, per vine, per plant, to prune it. Because what you do is, I brought some vines. Okay, when, when it gets to be a mess like that, what you've got to do is the, the vine over the winter, the part of what was there last, last year during the winter, it dies and it's just dead wood or dead vine. So you've got to study it before you just go in there and start whacking off, off vines coming off the trunk. You've got to study it and look and see which ones, which four are going to be the best four vines to keep on this trunk. Because once you cut it off, then it's kind of late if you discovered, well, the other one's not as good as you thought it was. So this one particular plant, 
it had a, a big mess on it. And so I started I'm going through that process and I'll clean my mess up here later and cut it off. It's dead there. Go back a little bit more, it's still dead. Do that, it's dead. It's dead. Dead. And I discovered bit by bit, a little bit at a time, that that whole, that whole branch coming off was dead. So I went to the next best branch and I cut it off. It's dead, dead, dead. I went through that whole vine, cut all the vines off all the way up to the trunk. They were all dead. So then I followed the vine down to the ground and it was about, the trunk was about that big around probably, maybe a little smaller. And I realized, then I realized Oh yeah, that's the one I hit the trunk with the lawnmower last summer and it cut it off. And the whole thing was dead. So that's, that illustrates why it's important to stay attached to the vine. Because if you're not, you're dead. Okay, but what you're looking for when you trim it back, I know you can't see this. I, cu I cut this one off this morning to illustrate. This is green. This is not dead. This probably won't break because all the rain we had last night, but you hear that snap? That's because it's dead. If it was dead, it wouldn't do that. It's, when it's alive, when it's green, it's more pliable. <clears throat> so our father, thankfully, is, is the expert vine dresser. And thankfully, he knows how to trim us where we need to be pruned. And he prunes us even though it hurts. And if you're like me, and I'm pretty sure you are, when you get pruned, what, every, every time when I would get down to the green, when I pruned, pruned it in early March, when I get down to the green, I cut it there, that's green. <clears throat> I look over there a few moments later, it's bleeding. That's what happens to us when we get when God prunes us. It hurts, and and when we get pruned, we're losing something that we had. We don't like that, and we don't like to hurt. We don't like to bleed. But that's that's part of the process, and it's necessary, and because God has to take some things away that are going to inhibit the growth that we need to have. Wes, do you want to go ahead and go to the next picture, please? Okay, this one, this is one of the vines that, I, that I've already pruned. As you can see, it's got the two lower arms and then the two upper arms. And it's starting to bud out and leave, leave out. That was in early, early to mid-March. <clears throat> okay, next picture, please. One of those is my arm and one's not. <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a grapevine. It's not in the vineyard, but it's on the back of the house uh, on a grape arbor that we built. And my, my dream was to have this grapevine there that, that would spread over the grape arbor that's about, I think, 12 by 14. And you could go out there and you could reach up and pick, pick grapes and that kind of thing. There it is right there. See the vine going up around the post? Okay, uh, go ahead to the next picture, Wes, please. <clears throat> okay, that's the vine. See what a tangled mess that is? See, it's kind of what I had in mind, but it didn't really pan out. And actually, our son-in-law, when, when they were visiting, he wanted, a, he wanted a little project to do, and I was resistant because we were smoking some brisket at the same time. But he really wanted to get up there and trim that. That vine had grown all the way up over the ridge of the house. And, and, and it, it, we've, we've come back from out of town sometimes. It's gone about 30 feet past the back door to the house. I mean, it just goes crazy. And you might think that's good, but it's not. And I'll look at it different times. Again, this has been grossly trimmed before that picture was taken. 
and I've looked at it different times and estimated in the spring how many bunches of grapes it has on it. The best I could tell when, you know, the little bunches are about this big and maybe the, the grapes about the size of a pinhead. <clears throat> Anybody, if, you know, best I could tell it probably had thousands of bunches of grapes on it. Anybody want to take a guess how many, how much fruit we got off of it? That's right, Christy's right, zero. Because what happens is it tries to produce way more than it's capable of. And I talked to the state viticulturalist about it back here a few years ago, and she said it's like a teenager that thinks it can do a lot more than what it can actually do. So the grapes look great until they're maybe a little bit smaller than a, than a, a sweet pea. Then they all just start, before you know it, they've all dried up and turned brown. And that's the end of it, no harvest. So the moral to the story is that vine needs to be greatly pruned. And what I plan to do is cut everything off of it except for probably three arms, one to go on each side of the, the vineyard, I mean on each side of the grape harbor. <clears throat> Okay, continuing back in verse 5 in John chapter 15. Well, I'll just recap back here at, at verse 1, I think it is. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, just uh, unless you abide in me, just like the trunk that I accidentally cut off with the lawnmower. It was all gone. You know, once it's severed, there's, there's no going back. I guess you could graft it on, maybe. <clears throat> okay, verse 5. Christ says, I am in the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Verse 7, we'll skip to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But this, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. <clears throat> okay, and then the, the, last, the last item, number four, the all-important pruning process. That's the one that hurts. But it's necessary, or you get that. <clears throat> so I'll... Uh, Read a couple of verses in John chapter 15 that I skipped just a moment ago. John 15, verse 2. I am, I am the true vine. Father is a vine dresser. That's verse 1. Verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it, that it may bear more fruit. That's exactly what happens when, when the vine is trimmed back to it's got four arms, and each arm is trimmed to, say, four to five feet long. And the objective is, I think you, you want to have about, uh, I think, five to six or seven bunches of grapes on each one. And, and if it's a good, healthy vine, it can support that and grow you know, quite a few bunches of grapes on it. But if it gets too spread out, just like that, it, it loses its effectiveness. <clears throat> When I pruned our, our vineyard back in March, I never consciously thought about this when I, was, when I was doing it, but when I was making my notes out, I realized that that's, I did exactly what this verse says happens, is the branches that needed to be pruned that were dead, I cut them off, and you know what I did with them? I loaded them in the trailer, hauled them to the burn pit, and burned them. That's what happens to us if, if we get detached from the vine. So that's why we need to stay attached. <clears throat> I'll read something else here I ran across regarding pruning. The pruning process. In life, we all go through a pruning process. God will prune our lives so that we can bear much fruit. To prune means something is cut away, something is removed. 
God knows what you need in your life in order to grow and flourish. Sometimes we have to just trust that He is working behind the scenes, preparing us for increase. Because a lot of times we're going through a trial and we don't, and I've asked myself lot, lots of times this, you're going through a sore trial and you keep one asking yourself, why am I going through this trial? You know, why is this necessary? Well, it's because God knows what's good for us. That even though it hurts and it's painful, it is for our own good. And if he, if he didn't do that, then that would mean he doesn't love us. So he does it. Sometimes we, we have to just trust that he is working behind the scenes, preparing us for increase, preparing us to, to go to a greater level of fruit production. I heard an expression a few years ago that I found helpful and comforting if I'm going through a trial or, or just, you know, even just in the course of work, something goes wrong and it's frustrating. <clears throat> and the expression is, if it's okay with God, it's okay with me. To me, that keeps things pretty simple. You know, if I'm getting frustrated, you know, if I'm working on something or, or, or whatever, if I just take a deep breath and realize, well, God knows what's going on. He can stop it if he wanted to. Apparently, he doesn't want to because this must be for my good. So that's okay with me. I'm glad, he, I'm glad it's, it's occurring. So what we should do when we're being pruned is we should thank God for loving us enough to prune us. And we should trust God, believing that He is working behind the scenes on our behalf. And we should trust God has good things in store for our future. As I mentioned earlier, everything God does is motivated from love. In the effort of full disclosure, I'll, I'll mention that the heading on this next part, I had conclusion was the heading, but I went back later and put pre-conclusion because it was kind of long for a conclusion. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to thank you. It's, don't want you to think it's just about done. One thing I discovered, I, I, maybe I knew this in the past, but have forgotten it, but in watching, I watched several YouTube videos on gardening a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> one of them, this guy was from Dallas, and he mentioned that, he said, the one thing they don't tell you when you buy tomato plants, I think that was the title of his YouTube video. And that one thing, he said, is they don't tell you that it's got to be a, between a low of this temperature and a high of this temperature for that tomato to put on a bloom. And if it's not in that temperature range, then it's not going to put on blooms and therefore it won't have any fruit. That kind of alarmed me and, and he gave the dates for this area, for the Dallas area, and we're probably pretty much in the same thing. Uh, he gave the dates on average of our area. It was from, I think it was middle, earlier mid-March to May 28th, I think. When I saw this video, that was May 29th. So I was not real happy to see that, but I went ahead and put it in my garden, and I'm, I'm trusting that it's going to do well. And it's got blooms on it. Time will tell. <clears throat> but in thinking about it, we're the same way. You know, we don't have eternity to put on a bloom. This is our time of being called right now. So we have to put on blooms now. We can't wait until later. Because later there won't be any blooms. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5 and read about the fruit that God is looking for. And I'm, I may read a little bit out of, out of here and a little bit of this uh, in the Amplified. Galatians 5, starting verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. In the Amplified, that verse says, In this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. 
Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. <clears throat> Continuing in verse 13 uh, in the New King James. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the love is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then dropping down to verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, and also envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Every time I read that, I don't, I don't know if, if you're like me, but I read that list of the works of the flesh and it just makes me feel kind of dirty and sticky like I need to take a bath. And then continuing on down with, with that in verse 21, breaking into the middle. Well, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in, in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here's the good part. <clears throat> Verse 22. This is what God's looking for. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In contrast, reading the, the, work, the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit com compared to the works of the flesh... It just makes you feel refreshed because it is refreshing. Verse 24, And those who are Christ have suffered the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. <clears throat> so now in conclusion, not the pre-conclusion, let's Number one, thank God that he is such a loving, gentle father. Two, walk with God daily, developing deep, strong roots. Three, stay attached to the vine, Jesus Christ. And four, let's thank God for being our ever-loving, ever-faithful vine dresser. And when we do that, just as the words in Wayne's song that he wrote, uh, to paraphrase it, to paraphrase a couple lines in it, we will hear him say, Well done, my faithful servant. Inherit what I have for you. Uh, hey, Wes. I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, he put it up there. I didn't know. That's what we're looking for right there is the fruit. 